Hello, I'm Jeremy Allaire, and this is The Money Movement. Uh, welcome to The Money Movement, a show where we explore and chronicle the issues and ideas driving this brave new world of digital currency and blockchains. Welcome back to this week's episode where we talk about the insane risks facing our global financial system and what this means for the prospects of full reserve money, including digital currency. For that discussion, we'll be joined by legendary crypto macro investor and crypto fund OG, Dan Moorhead of Pantera Capital. Then we're gonna go back in history a bit to revisit and discuss the famous Chicago plan which emerged from prominent economists during the depths of the Great Depression. We'll be brought along that journey with Colorado State University Professor Emeritus Ronnie Phillips, author of The Chicago Plan and New Deal Banking Reform. We also want to get a little bit more hands-on and concrete with the fundamentals of digital currencies. You know, digital currencies hold promise as both a safer form of money and a safer form of payments. And in this world of quote unquote insane risk, we want to explore those issues in detail with Hasib Qureshi, a crypto guru and investor who knows how to break things down in really understandable terms. So I just, I want to step back for a moment and do a little bit of context setting. The bigger mission we have here with this show is to help the average business leader to better understand the power and potential and real world value of stable coins, digital currency and public blockchain networks. And, it's pretty easy in this industry to zoom in and focus on the technology, but I think this often misses the bigger picture. You know, business leaders uh, need a broader global perspective and a way to translate uh, you know, what's happening in the global economy at large into concrete strategies for how to thrive, survive, and compete. And in this new area of technology, it so happens that the technology and broader fundamental issues of the economic system are deeply intertwined. Now, if I were running a small or medium business uh, with customers or partners or suppliers around the country uh, or around the world, um, I'm gonna be asking the question, you know, why, why bother? You know, uh, why is this so important? Uh, why is this technology uh, and adopting this technology uh, so important. And for me, how is this gonna help me as a business leader to uh, set my company up for success in, uh, in the next decade? And you know, to, uh, to answer these questions, you know, we need to look at both the forest and the trees. And we're gonna be doing a lot of that here on the money movement. And uh, momentarily, uh, we're gonna be joined by uh, Dan Moorhead from Pantera Capital, who's going to help us start to explore some of these global macro issues. Uh, we're just waiting for Dan to uh, pop in. Uh, and it looks like uh, Dan is, is, uh, is joining us now. Thanks, Dan, for, uh, for zooming in for this. And, you know, Dan, uh, you are uh, obviously the founder and CEO of Pantera Capital, one of the most successful and longstanding crypto macro and crypto venture capital funds in the world. Welcome, Dan. It's great to have you on the show. Jeremy, thanks for having me on. Excellent. So, uh, you know, you've spent your career in, you know, these global macro areas. You owned global macro and currency trading and so forth for some really major firms. You've seen a lot over the years. And I imagine, you know, that, you know, with that global macro background, it's, it's very much part of what drew you into the crypto space itself for many years. But, you know, with that background and perspective, I have to imagine that what you're seeing right now is pretty unprecedented. Um, you know, early, I, earlier I talked about the quote unquote insane risk that exists out there right now. Talk to us about what you see. What are the major global macro risks that exist for the world over the next say 24 or 36 months? Yeah, so I have been doing this for 35 years. So I've seen a lot of cycles, I've seen a lot of strange things, um, invested in some pretty asymmetric trades, but Bitcoin itself, when I first saw it in 2011, I realized it was orders of magnitude bigger than all those other trades that I traded. And then this thing that's happening right now, we are seeing an unprecedented use of the word unprecedented. I mean, this thing is just off the charts. 
And uh, there's a lot of things I don't understand about what's going on in the macro situation, but the absolute clarity is, is very, very positive for blockchain asset prices. That if you're gonna increase the quantity of money to like an infinite amount, it will certainly float things that have fixed quantity like blockchain. So I think this is an amazing time. The next 24 months are a time for blockchain to prove itself both in terms of uh, actual functionality and, and fundamentals, but also the technicals are, are really overwhelming. Yeah. And what are, you know, what are the, the, the macro risks? You know, what are the, the major risks that are out there um, for the financial sector uh, with different economies? Like, you know, what do you see as the, the, the deepest risks that we're seeing? Yeah, so this virus has prompted a lot of different responses around the world. Uh, countries are trying really, really different regimes to combat it. Uh, <clears throat> one of the most common, uh, particularly in the United States, is, is essentially just fiscal and monetary stimulus to combat the virus. And the amount of that stimulus is, is just off the charts. And people have been successively walking that back from this is the biggest recession since 2008. It's the biggest one since World War II. And even people are stopping at the Great Depression. The fiscal stimulus we're doing now is larger than the Great Depression. And the stimulus is expected in just 2019-20, the fiscal year now, to be larger than the average of the years during World War II. You know, so this is, there is no qualifier to it. It's the biggest deficit ever. And that's going to have profound impacts on households, corporations, banking, and my business, blockchain. Yeah, no, without a doubt. And we're obviously, uh, you know, we're seeing this flight to safe haven assets such as Bitcoin and gold. Bitcoin is actually now sort of the top performing asset uh, in 2020 uh, to date. Um, but we're also, you know, we're seeing this tremendous flight to dollars. Um, as an example, from pre-pandemic levels to today, USDC has surged almost 75% in terms of coins in circulation. It does not appear to be slowing down. You know, talk to us for a minute about this flight to digital dollars. Where do you think that's headed? Yeah, I think that one's simple is, would you rather have your money in the Lehman Brothers of 2020 or in USDC, right? Like USDC or, you know, things like it are tokens you control. They're fully backed by U.S. Treasuries. There's no fractional reserve lending or any of those things. And um, I think it's entirely rational. And that's, that goes for people in the developed world. Like, you know, you and I live in the United States. Our banking system's pretty sound. If something bad happens, the government's probably gonna bail it out, right? Most of the people on earth don't live in a country like that. They live in countries where the currencies are terrible. Uh, if the banks go under, they're just gonna lose all their life savings. And so for those people, I can totally see why they're putting their money in a, um, token that's backed by U.S. Treasuries. Right, right. Uh, obviously, uh, we're, we're excited about the use case, but you touched on something I want to come back to, which is this amount, the amount of fiscal and monetary intervention. This is sort of these depression era levels of economic contraction. You know, are we not inevitably going to see very real and very deep global solvency risks at the household level, at the firm level, at the bank level and even at the national sovereign level? And you know, how quickly could the solvency issues become much more fundamental banking sector issues? And you know, obviously, as you said, we're not just talking about the US, we're talking about banking sectors all over the world. Yeah, I, I share your view. I think it's gonna be a really serious uh, financial um, scenario for each of those stacks, you know, the household sector, the, the municipal sector, the state, national government. Um, and there's, early talk of a V-shaped recovery, which I think is completely crazy, that we have an invisible physical barrier to commerce that then will precipitate a psychological barrier to commerce. And so I think this is unfortunately even much more like an L-shaped recovery that yeah. we had this yeah. big step down. And if the Fed cut a thousand basis points, I'm not going to the movies, right? Like it just, there isn't any kind of fiscal or monetary stimulus that's gonna make me wanna to go to the movies. So. Right. I think it's going to take a long time. The last recession, 2008-9, it took three years to achieve the same level of GDP. Um, this one's bigger. So I think it's going to take a long time. And that will unfortunately have a huge impact on the solvency of all those different stacks yeah. you're talking about. And there's this interesting intersection here. Obviously, this raises much more fundamental questions, you know, questions that have really been raised now for, you know, 
you know, almost a hundred years. And I think they're as, as pertinent as ever today, which is this question of like, what is truly sound money? And what does a sound banking system look like here? You know, I'm talking about full reserve banking, full reserve monetary systems, this quote unquote, the real bills doctrine and so forth. And you know, we have a, a prominent guest coming up next to talk more about some of the history behind this thinking. But right here, right now, we have, you know, we have Bitcoin, which is by definition a full reserve asset. Um, even, you know, the new Chinese digital currency, DCEP, it's a full reserve digital currency. And of course, stable coins such as USDC, as you know, these are by defin, you know, by, by, you know, by definition, fully reserved systems of money. You know, what do you think? Is, is this the future of the banking system? I think it is. And, and, you know, again, if you look around the world, not just myopically on the United States, the US dollar is one of the least bad paper currencies. It's, it's only lost 90% of its purchasing power since 1950. But most people live in countries where all the purchasing power has been wiped out. And it's for two reasons. One is there's you know excessive risk taking in the banking sector, like we saw in 2008-9. And then they just print more and more of it. And now we even have an official term, quantitative easing. They're actually advertising the fact they're trying to increase the quantity of paper money. A great example would be the, the British pound sterling, right? It used to be exchangeable for a pound of sterling silver. And they printed so many of these pieces of paper, it takes 184 paper pieces of pound sterling to buy one pound of sterling silver. So if you keep debasing the currency like that, people are going to look for alternatives. And before uh, Bitcoin, there really wasn't an alternative. Gold obviously has been working for millennia, but there wasn't kind of a, a modern version of that. And now with all these different uh, stable coins like USDC and Bitcoin, you can store your wealth, move your wealth in something that's not being eased. And actually on Monday, we had a quantitative tightening the amount of Bitcoins issued to the market was cut by 50%, which is the opposite of the way paper money is going. Uh, and it's always, you know, there's no leverage in it. There's no default risk or whatever. Right. If you buy a Bitcoin, you reserve. Can hold it. For, right. Yeah, there's no reserve. You can hold it for 20 years and it's still going to be exactly the same percentage of the total outstanding that you started with. So uh, I think people will shift to those. And you've seen it in USDC, 75% yeah. growth in the last yeah. six weeks. A couple of years from now, that could be thousands of percent growth, right? Yeah, it's incredible. Dan, uh, as usual, uh, your perspective has been, you know, tremendous. You know, really appreciate you joining us today on the show and, and hope to have you back again soon as, as, you know, this global macro tsunami does not appear to be settling down anytime soon. So thanks so much, Dan. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. Sound money full reserve banking, in my mind, it's not very coincidental that fundamental breakthroughs in the monetary system based on these new technologies, including Bitcoin, including stable coins and blockchains, and new initiatives in central bank digital currency are rooted in this ideal of full reserve or 100% money. There's really an incredible history here, and uh, much of it was anchored in the thinking of the great economists of the Chicago School of Economics. So we're going to take a little stroll back in history and try to contextualize the here and the now with that history. And to help us explore that, I'm incredibly pleased to welcome uh, Professor Emeritus of Economics at CSU, Ronnie Phillips. Welcome, Ronnie. Thanks so much for joining the Money Movement. Uh, thanks, uh, Jeremy. And I'm um, uh, happy. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you great. Thank okay, you. Great. Yeah, so, um, you know, in your book, uh, The Chicago Plan and, and New Deal Banking Reform, you chronicle an incredible amount of thinking and debate and ultimately policy outcomes uh, that happened during the Great Depression um, and that period. It's a fascinating read and, and obviously a really valuable contribution. But I'd like it if you could just set the scene for us a little bit here. Uh, it's the height of the Great Depression. We've seen dramatic failures in the banking system, fiscal policy errors as well. And a bunch of economists out of Chicago put forward a plan, the so-called Chicago plan. What was happening and, and what was this plan? Well, on March 4th, 1933, uh, Roosevelt is inaugurated. That's on a Saturday. He gave his famous uh, speech, we had nothing to fear but fear itself. Shortly thereafter, he was notified that the banks in New York would be closed on Monday. And what was he going to do? Fortunately, Hoover's Treasury officials had prepared the Emergency Banking Act, which 
was the, uh, to close all banks in the United States. And Roosevelt said, okay, let's go with it. So they closed all the banks uh, uh, beginning March 6th. Now, on March 12th, Roosevelt goes on his first famous uh, in fireside chat, explains to people that we've closed the banks, we're gonna reopen them, and things are gonna be okay. So by March 15th, when they, they opened 90% of the banks, and there weren't incredible bank runs. Now, on March 16th, the Chicago economist, led by Henry Simons, sent a memo to uh, Henry Wallace, who was then Secretary of Agriculture, saying that what they needed to do for long-term recovery was make all Federal Reserve notes legal tender and require all commercial banks to hold 100% in cash reserves or on account at the Fed. This would create safety in the payment system, but would it also enable uh, fiscal operations to create as much money as was needed to uh, to restore economic uh, viability in the economy. Right, so we have these these two these two pieces here, right? We have um, you know the, the 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 classic scene and it's a wonderful life. And what do you mean? My money's not in the bank. I put the money right. in the bank. Uh, you know this. You know the fact that money is created by banks and there's this fractional reserve. They're only holding say ten percent of the money that they're actually lending out. It sort of leads to this fundamental risk, right? And it sounds like. You know, these leading economists were saying, we don't need to have this risk. We don't need to put ourselves in a position where people basically, you know, banks go bankrupt and people go bankrupt. Well, to put it real simply, we know banks do two things. They make loans and they also provide a convenient means of payment, your checking account and so on. David Ricardo at 1823, famous economist, pointed out, there's no reason why these two functions have to be in the same institution. And that's what the Chicago economists are saying. These can be in separate institutions. And that's what we're seeing today, you know, with PayPal, with digital currencies. The private sector can get into the payment system, but they don't have to be involved in lending. There's no reason to believe that there's something special about banks that they can do both of these most efficiently. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess, you know, you know we're, we're trying to contextualize some of this for, you know, business leaders today. If you're, if you're a business leader, you're running a business, um, you, know, uh, you know, why should I care about this? Why should, I, why should I be interested in participating in a full reserve system versus this, you know, high risk fractional reserve system? Well, we've got, one of the things to talk about is basically problems of illiquidity and insolvency. Illiquidity is when a financial firm can't easily get exchange assets for a medium of exchange. Insolvency is when your assets are less than your liabilities and you go under. So what we, <clears throat> what we really need is, first of all, a safe payment system, you know, and that's the 100% uh, reserve and, again, backed by safe assets. And then for lending, it can be mutual funds or other types of things. If the government, and one of the things I'd like to point out that is a problem in the past and maybe a problem today, is the Federal Reserve should be concerned about illiquidity. If the Fed is uh, also involved in bailing out insolvencies, that's where we have a real problem. The Treasury and Congress should do insolvencies, the Federal Reserve for illiquidity. Right, I, I guess coming back to this theme of insane risk and where we are today, you know, for the past 90 years, uh, you know, we've continued to build on this fractional reserve money system. We've continued to see excessive bank risk taking, driving all kinds of challenges in the economy. But, you know, here we are today. The world is facing another depression and a likely widespread insolvency crisis. You know, you know what, what are the steps that we can take to move towards sound money? And you've talked a little bit about that. But, you know, what does the banking system look like if we embrace this? Obviously, this fully reserved payment system you know, how does lending happen? Um, you know, this mutual fund model, talk a little bit more about, you know, how do we, how do we move to a, a new model? And maybe that new model gets built in this new all digital realm and, and the legacy system remains this higher risk system. You know, when I was working my book, I, I thought at the time that, you know, legislation is not the most efficient way of, of achieving this type of change, you know, of fundamental change. And that really the market would do it. And I think that's what we're seeing in the payment system. Apple Pay, Walmart, everybody wants to get into the payment system. And I think the private sector can have, the private non-bank sector can have 
a larger role in the payment system and making that safe. Again, and the Federal Reserve can help with any liquidity problems in the payment system. The lending has to be through basic mutual fund institutions. Assets and liabilities have to be consistent. And the, if there are insolvencies, you know, when banks go under and, and are insolvent, you have the FDIC, which has a, an insurance fund, and it also has a line of credit to the treasury. They can intervene to deal with insolvencies. That's the role of the FDIC, the treasury, and Congress uh, to deal with insolvencies. The payment system, that's the private sector and um, the, the Federal Reserve. Right. Those things have to be really separate. And I think that's where we're going. Right. Now, obviously, here on the money movement, we're talking about, you know, digital currency, blockchains. And as I noted early, earlier, nearly all of the major innovations in this specific space, non-sovereign money like Bitcoin, leading stable coins, you know, such as USDC, even cutting edge uh, central bank digital currencies like China's DCEP are all built on a full <laughs> reserve model. It's sort of, uh, as I like to say, uh, you know, the native physics of, uh, of digital assets. Um, you know, do you think this is a key piece of the puzzle in, in, oh, oh, in yeah. the financial system? Yes, yes, for sure. I mean, that, that's, that's very important. The, the development of the stable coins, the U.S. digital coin and so on, those, those are key to the future development of the payment system. And I, I think that those developments should be allowed to continue. I would like to point out, uh, remember that the Federal Reserve has a Trump uh, uh, move they can make here in that Federal Reserve liabilities are legal tender. One of the things that they could, uh, could do is say, hey, if, if the Federal Reserve starts issu issuing digital coins, they can say this is legal tender. Sure. That gives them, that restores their monopoly that they've, that they've had. Yeah, I don't think that's seeing, necessarily you know, a good thing. A, a version of this happening in, in China literally unfold as right. we speak. But Ronnie, this, is, uh, this has been an incredibly fascinating discussion. And I really want to thank you for making yourself available to us today and, and hope uh, yeah. to speak again soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. So zooming out for the forest is, I think, you know, really critical right now. And, and these ideas have not just inspired uh, economists, but increasingly are a fundamental part of the inspiration behind crypto and blockchains. So sound money, full reserve banking, a safer, more trustworthy financial system. These are all goals that motivate and inspire the technologists and entrepreneurs who are actively building this new global system. These are the real leaders of the money movement. But with all that context, I now really want to zoom in and look a little bit uh, at the trees and um, you know, a, a fundamental premise of digital currency and an economic system built on public blockchains is the idea that this is actually a safer, more secure and more trustworthy infrastructure for money. I'm excited to bring on our third guest himself, a highly thoughtful, creative technologist, one of the sharpest people I've met in this space and now a managing partner at the up and coming crypto fund Dragonfly Capital, Haseeb uh, Qureshi. Welcome Haseeb, it's great to see you again. Good to see you as well, Jeremy. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So I, I, I just wanted to start uh, providing a little bit of context for, for the audience on, on how we met, I think, which was over uh, two years ago. And, and you, had, uh, you had released uh, actually one of the, one of the best kind of uh, medium posts on, on the ideas of stable coins. You were incubating a startup to launch a stable coin called uh, none other than USDC. <laughs> That's right. we, were, we were talking to you about uh, <laughs> Imminent launch of a stable coin called uh, USDC. A lot's transpired since then, and I, I suspect a lot of things that got you excited about stable coins and public chains back then, you know, they're as exciting as ever for you right now. I'm I'm more excited than ever. It's very clear that the macro situation that we're in right now kind of puts us on this precipice. You know, COVID nineteen has accelerated a lot of things in our lives, but one of the things that I think it's very obviously going to accelerate is all of the trends that you, know, you and I were talking about two years ago yeah. about the, the adoption and acceleration of stable coins. So I, I think it's a, it's a really important time right now to keep your eyes wide open. Yeah, I mean, this, this sort of adoption cycle, people are always looking for like, what are the killer apps? And you know, where are we in an adoption cycle? You know, with, with stable coins becoming, uh, you know, growing and, and really, as you said, in the COVID world, like really starting to grow. You know, wh where are we on that cycle and, and you, know, where, you know, how do you see them becoming a, a literally a fundamental part of the way the economic system functions? Well, I, so I, I tend to think that uh, the, the really interesting thing about 
stable coins is that they they basically give you a, a new different kind of substrate for transferring money. And you know, historically blockchains have, have been ways to transfer new kinds of currencies that were untethered from the, the real economy, right? So obviously they started with Bitcoin, Ethereum, now that you know the hundreds of other stable coins, or not stable coins, cryptocurrencies that you can that you can trade and speculate on. Uh, but the, the real thing that has started to unlock uh, this bridge between the old economy and the new economy has been stable coins, has been the, the, you know, the reality is today, Bitcoin, as much as I love it, I, you know, it's one of the most exciting assets in the world to hold right now, it's not money. Uh, th there is one thing that we, we don't have to ask ourselves a question of whether it's money, uh, is, is if you're tokenizing a fiat currency and you're transferring it through a permissionless blockchain, uh, that is money and it's being treated like money. On any given day, stable coins actually trade more in volume than Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of these other crypto right. assets. Certainly and become the, 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 the killer act on these blockchains. That's right, that's right. Sort of pound for pound, if you look at market cap to transaction volume, yeah. you could argue there's more product market fit for stable coins than anything else in crypto. Yeah. And that has accelerated pretty intensely in the last three months with the advent of COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, in large part, because you've seen growing demand for dollars around the world and a lot more, you know, just this, this transition from risky assets to safe assets, this is getting mirrored in the demand for stable coins all across crypto. And I think, sorry, it sounds like you're- No, no, go ahead. No, no. But what I was gonna say was that, you know, as the, as the global macro picture becomes increasingly uncertain, and as demand for dollars increases, especially outside of the US, all of that global demand for dollars is getting siphoned to the most natural place that it can go, which is through, through instant permissionless access to dollars. Right. And that's happening through stable points today. Right. So I, yeah, this is fascinating. I, I think, you know, you're someone, uh, you know, I think who you do a great job of, of clearly articulating things. And as we look a little bit more deeply here, as I say, at the trees, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you can help the audience get to some of the fundamentals. You touched on, you know, safer, uh, lower risk, you know, uh, th these things. So, you know, for, for business people who are thinking like, you know, why would I use this, et cetera? Um, safety, risk, trust around payments on blockchains, fundamental concepts here. You know, why, why are stable coins as a form of digital currency, why are these safer for payments? Why are they safer for payments? Uh, actually, maybe I should ask you that question because that's not how I would answer it. Uh, what, what I would say, and you can feel free to, to correct me on, on, uh, if you think I'm wrong here, but I think that there, it's not so much safer as it is a fundamentally different set of trade-offs that you're making with, with a stable coin. So mm -hmm. I, I have this line that crypto is financial unbundling, right? It's this idea that if you're signing up for the traditional financial system, um, if you're using traditional payment rails, then basically you're, you're buying a bundle of things all at the same time of which you cannot opt out of any individual component. And the beauty, I think, of stable coins is that it, it basically goes back to that unbundled version of money where you can say, look, mm -hmm. all I want is to send this much value from A to B. And if I want insurance, if I want uh, uh, reversibility, if I want, uh, you know, if, if, if I want some other kind of constraint on the way that this money can be sent or transferred or reverted, I can add those in, I can program those in, right? That's sort of the right. value of being able to write contracts directly on top of money is that I don't have to right. accept anybody else's definition of how money ought to be transferred. I can take all that on have kind of myself. These layers. And there's these layers. The base layer is like this this digital cash, digital unit of account that is, as you said, it's unbundled and atomic and, and sort of works like any other kind of piece of data on the internet. Exactly, exactly. So it, it, in, in that way, it very much mirrors the internet itself, right? The, the internet began with, with you know, these, these kinds of super bundled experiences like AOL, where mm -hmm. the idea was like, look, you don't know what you're doing. We're not, you, you we can't be trusted to just go to the internet. So we're going to give you this nice little landing page and there's going to be this portal and you'll, you'll go here and this part will be just for kids and this part is just for cars and, and, and we'll manage everything, right? And it, it became very clear that the, the innovation of the internet was really unlocked by unbundling things, by letting anybody, first of all, build anything on the right. internet, but second, letting anybody opt in to what parts of the internet they wanted to have access to and to access it on their terms. Right. And Open I think networks permissionless infrastructure, fundamental concepts here. And, and, and now we have that being applied to money, basically. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So here, here's a question, I think, you know, um, you know for, for a lot of 
you know, people who are new to this, or let's say you're running a business, you're new to this sort of some sort of blockchain one-on-one fundamentals, like, you know, help explain how, how is it that a, a completely decentralized infrastructure, it's not controlled by any corporation, it's not controlled by a government, how can that be more secure uh, or sort of safer than uh, uh, the centralized systems that, that people are so accustomed to? That's a great question. And I think for, for many corporations, it's tough to wrap your head around how something that nobody is in charge of can actually be robust and resilient. Uh, the, the best analogy that I can think of is, again, kind of coming back to these old, old themes of, of thinking of the internet. Yeah. In the early days of the internet, of course, you know, everybody, the, the, the dominant way that corporations interacted with the internet was create, they would say, okay, there's this cool idea that you can share documents and send packets and information very cheaply. Uh, so let's create our own personal intranet so that only people within our corporation can contact each other. Uh, and the internet, I mean, okay, that's a kind of a cute idea, you know, maybe it'll go somewhere, but it's not really meant for, for you know, real industrial use, right? And it's very clear that it's reversed. Where today, actually, you know, if you're running your own data center, that actually ends up being more difficult to run. You have probably worse downtime, you have probably worse performance than relying on somebody like AWS to run that system for you in a way that benefits from this, you know, giant economy of scale. In the yeah. same way, Ethereum you can think of as the, the largest economy of scale of any system in the world, where literally everybody in the world has an incentive to keep Ethereum running because right. there are it the is. miners, there are the users. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, uh, everybody in the system has an incentive to keep the system running, and so it does. And so Ethereum has had better uptime than AWS over, over this quarantine. You know, Ethereum hasn't been down for a single minute. And what that, what, that, what that reflects, I think, is a new kind of way of thinking about what infrastructure should look like when it comes to mm -hmm. resilience and robustness, right? Something that like a public, is orchestrated public infrastructure. by incentives. It is, yes. right. And, it's, and it is this fundamentally public infrastructure, uh, which, which makes it so, so unique and you know, designed, as you know, people say, to be resilient against nation state level attack vectors. Uh, which in this world, you know, is, is there, um, you know, for, for, uh, for the novice, um, you know, you know, Ethereum is secured through an incentive system and through this quote unquote proof of work model, you know, you know, what is that security model actually? Can you just explain in really simple terms? What is, what is the security model that? <laughs> makes sure, it? sure. Uh, let's see. So proof of work in two minutes. Uh, so, so, uh, okay. So basically the idea of proof of work is that, um, you have uh, the whole idea of proof of work. So this started with Bitcoin, of course, and Ethereum sort of is a continuation of the same model. Um, so the, the whole idea of proof of work is that the way that the system is secured is that basically, you know, the way Satoshi Nakamoto put it is one CPU, one vote. So the idea is that you have all these people all around the world, essentially using their computers to try to mine Bitcoin. And for now we can sort of, you know, ignore what mining actually means, but basically it means you're voting with your computer. And the idea is that uh, it's possible that there are enough bad people out there with enough computers that they might uh, make Bitcoin or make Ethereum do the wrong thing. They might make it uh, disobey its fundamental rules of operating kind of, you know, one step at a time and, and doing, uh, never reverting any transactions. Uh, the way that we know that these things are secure is basically by, by the fact that we know that the majority of people out in the world, the majority of the computers that are actually voting in these systems, their incentive is to keep the system going because the system is paying them. The system is paying them to, to keep it going. If the, if the validity of the system were jeopardized because of the fact that somebody were voting maliciously with their computers and overtaking the network, if they had more than all the computing power of everybody else combined in the network, they could do that. But the problem is there's so many people who are making money mining that it's not worth it for them to do that. And right now mining is, is a business on the order of you know, tens of billions of dollars in the world. And so what that tells you is that Economics, not altruism, but economics, is what drives the security of these protocols. And in over, you know, it's been 11 plus years now that Bitcoin has been operating, and it has never had a 51% attack. Meaning, in other yeah. words, that it has always operated in this game theoretic way. No matter how much value, you can already see, you know, over $100 billion of value secured by this network, and not once in 11 years, you know, and this is in, in its infancy, not once in 11 years has the system been corrupted, which tells you that incentives work. They're working. Yeah, and we're seeing that with Ethereum too. And this is, you know, we have this That's public right. infrastructure 
it's this like essentially this global secure database transaction system operating system everyone can connect to it everyone can rely upon it it's it's you know nation state attack resilient uh, etc so we have we have this layer um we we're we we're touching on stable coins before you know i guess just coming back to the topic sort of you know are stable coins basically like an app on these operating systems you know and they sort of sit on top of the security of these underlying networks and operating systems so uh yes with the with the so, so, sort of, it's like, uh, so you could say that uh, a stablecoin inherits some of the security of the underlying chain. At the same time, the stablecoin also depends upon the security of the organization that's actually issuing the stablecoin. So you sort of have these, these two security constraints simultaneously, right? So provided that the organization, so, you know, you know the, the, the largest stablecoin today is Tether, right? And a lot of people, I think rightly, look at Tether and they say, okay, well, this is you know, kind of a shady corporation. Is this, is this really a, a, a trustworthy instrument of commerce? And a lot of people say no, which is why uh, you know, Tether isn't really used for trading in the US. Uh, but then you have, you have other stable coins like USDC, like Gemini Dollar, like PAX, that are issued by organizations that are regulated by the NYDFS. And th at that point, basically, you're, you're trusting the regulatory body that uh, governs the issuance of these stable coins and the underlying blockchain, which I think is is as robust as anything you could ask for. So I'd say, yeah, it absolutely uh, inherits from the security of that underlying blockchain to make sure that when you transfer money, that transfer of money is secure. Yeah, we're we're definitely seeing policy and regulatory around these sort of stablecoin arrangements. It's is is really coming to the forefront, and um, you know, Center Consortium, as you know, is uh, involved in a lot of that. Um, you know, again, kind of back to the basics for like just you know. Joe business owner, um, we talk about risk and settlement risk and other things, just apples to apples, right? If, if you're paying someone with a card or a bank transfer, there's typically a delay. There's this possibility of reversals and chargebacks that that's really different than say, if I give someone cash, right? You give them the cash, they have the cash, which are, you know, it's a pretty much an irreversible transaction. Maybe you could try and enforce something in court, but you know, how, how, do, how do stable coin based payments compare? It is this instant digital electronic money, but it sort of behaves more like cash, like, you know, from a, from a risk perspective, a counterparty risk perspective, how, how do you see that? So that's, that's absolutely right. And it is really the first version of digital cash that we really have today. Um, you know, the, the, because consumers do not have access to uh, deposits at the Fed, right, which are really the only version of quote unquote digital cash that, that you can say truly exists in the, in the world today besides stable coins. Uh, stable coins have sort of become the first way that you get the same settlement properties of cash where there, there's no way for the system to revert. There's no T plus N settlement time. It's, it's instantaneous. And the moment you give it to somebody, it's a bare instrument, you know, cool. You can move on with your life. You never have to ask another question. Uh, that kind of commerce has, has, has been increasingly eroded over time with basically right. regulators and governments kind of attaching more and more strings to the traditional financial system. And, you know, it, it's, it's one thing to talk about how frustrating that is for small business owners who might get their accounts frozen by PayPal or frozen by their bank or, or whatever, and basically locking themselves completely out of commerce. Um, it's even more frustrating for people around the world. And so, you know, one of the things that I pay a lot of attention to is the, the demand in emerging markets for stable coins, yeah. where, you know, they, they, have, they have even less access, even less recourse to being able to use dollars, which of course, for, for many international transactions, uh, they, it is the reserve currency of the world for a good right. reason. And, and even if they can use dollars, it's, uh, you know, maybe a regional bank. And we were talking earlier, obviously, about some of the, you know, full reserve versus fractional reserve and solvency risk. And in today's world, like these are deeper issues. And so stable coins, obviously, you know, re represent uh, these tokens on, on in, in a sense, on U.S. government, you know, bonds. It's a, it's a different kind of safety as well in that sense. That's right. That's right. And so, look, the, the, the equation at the end of the day is that if you want what PayPal is offering, you can use PayPal. But if you want what USDC is offering, you can use USDC. That's what I mean by financial unbundling, is that ultimately it, it's only ever a good thing to give more choice to people. And USDC or any other stablecoin gives people that choice to say, look, here's the bundle of things that I want with my money. And here are the, here, and these things I can, I can either pick and choose, or I can say, look, I don't, I don't want that. I don't need that for my business. And that, not, that trade-off won't be right for every business, but it will be right for some. You bet. Hasid, uh, your insights have been incredibly helpful. I'm sure the audience would agree. I want to thank you for joining the show today and 
hope to speak to you again soon. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. Absolutely. Take care, Steve. Really interesting conversation and obviously uh, a lot more to explore here, you know, from the global economic crisis and its impact on our financial system to looking back in history to find answers, connecting the dots to the here and the now. Uh, we're trying to bring you to the front lines of the money movement. Uh, if you agree, don't forget to hit subscribe, like this video, spread the word. Um, I'm also really excited about next week's show. We're going to dive into the power of programmable money, these smart contracts and code that can be deployed on these blockchain networks. And you know, while stable coins you know, in and of themselves are incredibly cool and powerful, it's their synthesis with other smart contracts on blockchains that really unleash the potential. These are sort of the Lego bricks of the new economic system and are being built by incredible creators and entrepreneurs all around the world. And next week, we're going to be joined uh, by the founders of three projects that are innovating in really different ways. So Compound Finance founder Robert Leshner is going to join us to talk about using stablecoins with decentralized credit markets. Uh, Sablier founder Paul Rosvin uh, Berg is going to join us to talk about their new open protocol for streaming payments, uh, which is a really powerful idea for you know, paying people by the second, by the minute, by the job, uh, and streaming those payments uh, uh, through, through blockchains using stablecoins. And then finally, Claros founder and CEO Federico Arst uh, from Buenos Aires is going to join us uh, to talk about their smart contract-based escrow system and decentralized arbitration model. As Hasib was mentioning, if you want that layer, you want the base digital cash layer, but let's say you wanna have an escrow relationship or you wanna have some rules around that. Uh, Claris has built a system to do that and they've even built a system that allows for arbitration around disputes on escrows and other things that's all decentralized, runs on these blockchains. Very fascinating stuff. Uh, so excited for next week. Uh, until next week, stay well, stay safe, and stay informed. Thank you.